is drawing the line? You know, all of you have probably had an opportunity, I would guess, to teach youth. And, you know, maybe that was difficult with this subject, maybe it come easier. But we need to draw a line, we need to have a clear, bright line that everybody... And when we start opening the gate, then that line starts drifting. This is the problem we have now. We open the gate a little bit, the line moves farther and farther and farther. Because it's difficult to draw the line if you don't draw it with abstinence only. We have gone so far in a culture that we don't even know how to teach abstinence only. Because in our minds we've been, you know, we've been culturally watered down to think that we have to teach about sex. We have to teach about having sex and how to get away with it. Which is intellectually dishonest, they've already said. If we taught a culture of marriage and love within marriage and the, the downside of sex outside of marriage. Some of you have experienced that maybe. I can promise you that never happens and has good results. So why don't we just be honest with our children? Why don't we be honest and tell them right up front that sex outside of marriage is devastating. There's no evidence that it is nothing else. I would encourage you, do not take, go back to abstinence-centered, you open the gate, and that allows you to talk about 99% of something else, and maybe learn, have everybody in the class learn how to spell abstinence, and that's all they'll learn about it. Please don't go there. Uh, my name is Cougar Hall, and I'm an assistant professor at Brigham Young University. Uh, I have a background in health education. I taught high school for ten and a half years before coming to BYU. And uh, as a health educator, uh, sexual education was part of the core curriculum, and so that was a unit of instruction that I provided. Uh, my training in graduate school at the University of Utah, I have a master's degree in health promotion and education, and I have a PhD from the College of Education in Teaching and Learning. House Bill 363 takes Utah's sexuality education curriculum from what's termed an abstinence-based program, where we teach and advocate and promote for abstaining of risky sexual behaviors until marriage. We provide instruction related to contraception. We don't advocate for its use. Uh, we don't even explain how to use contraception. But what House Bill 363 does is it takes us from an abstinence-based curriculum to an abstinence-only curriculum. Uh, it says to school districts, if you are going to teach sexuality education, so now we're giving them the option to opt out of that instruction, but if you're going to provide it, it can only be abstinence no discussion of anything else. So I think it limits Utah schools and especially Utah teachers tremendously. My name is Liz Zentner and I'm the Utah PTA president-elect right now and um, I spent three years as the health commissioner for PTA and as the health commissioner I would spend probably 40 hours a week at the Capitol during the session and I would be following all the bills that have to do with children and health. So as a result of that I've had to work on or against two other bills that have to do with sex ed in the schools. I feel that House Bill 363 uh, will have a very detrimental effect on the students in Utah. I think that, that they will be looking for this information. They want to know how to prevent pregnancies and STDs. And I feel like if it's handled in the right way, which is exactly how it's handled in the Utah schools because of all the laws and regulations, I feel like they will receive the strong message that abstinence is the best way to go. And I think that having a little instruction on the um, con contraception and how it isn't, doesn't quite, it isn't quite perfect and it, it doesn't completely make you safe, I think turns them in the direction of abstinence, helps them to realize that they can't just go ahead and do what they want and get away with it because they may end up with some kind of a disease or a pregnancy that they will have to deal with the rest of their life. So another problem is if the children, if, if they do not get the information from a good um, source, then they're going to look for it elsewhere. They're going to ask their friends and you know that's probably not going to be accurate. They're going to they're going to go to the internet. I think that this whole thing will backfire on these people that don't want the children to have this sex ed, I think they're gonna end up with higher STD rates, higher pregnancy rates. We just had a big event at the Capitol called PTA Day at the Capitol. And we had 
about 280 parents there, PTA leaders. And when we told them about this bill, they were angry that they were having their rights taken away by these ultra-conservative rights groups, that they were having their right to have their children hear the message that they want them to hear. Every year at our PTA convention, we pass resolutions. Those resolutions are debated, they're, they're voted on, they're amended, they're changed, whatever, but whatever the end result is, that's what we use for our mar marching orders at the Capitol, and we do not take positions on bills that we don't have resolutions for. So when you know that we take a position like we do on this bill, that we oppose it because we feel like children need to have some discussion of contraception in their health classes, that that is what the parents want. And we represent 120,000 PTA members all over Utah. We represent the most public school parents. My experience in teaching sexuality education uh, in the Alpine School District and in Utah schools in general, I should say, um, students, especially by the high school, by 10th grade, they're well aware of what's happening in the world. They're well aware of what's, of what's happening in their schools. They have classmates who have chlamydia. They have classmates who have gonorrhea. Uh, they've had a great amount of media exposure and uh, they are ready for these messages. They're ready to talk about sexuality. Uh, not necessarily to talk about how to be a better lover, because we don't talk about that in Utah schools, but they have questions. What's safe? What's not safe? What's okay? What's not okay? Uh, what are the changes that I've experienced? And how come my moods and my emotions are all over the map right now? How come it's become difficult in the last couple of years for me to talk to, you know, female classmates or male classmates? What's going on inside of me? And is that going to change? Um, what did you do when you were dating Mr. Hall? Uh, what kind of dates were most enjoyable? What kind of dates allowed you to get to know your date better? And when was it okay to introduce intimacy into a dating relationship? And what type of intimacy is, is safe? Um, what about marriage, Mr. Hall? How do you handle some of the conflicts? I hear my parents arguing. How do you communicate and resolve concerns in your marriage? How do we respect and how should, how should we interact with um, things that we run into in the media? I've watched a show and they talked about homosexuality. What is homosexuality? What are the risks? How should we treat those that have a different sexual orientation? These are questions that have come up in every single class period I've ever taught. Students are well aware of what's happening in the world and they want to know. Uh, some of them talk to their parents and some have parents who are open with them and talk about them. But I would say the majority of parents and in the majority of homes that young people you know, go home to, all sexuality issues are a taboo topic. My name is Mackenzie McMillan. I'm here uh, to talk to you today as a student. I am against the bill. Um, as a student, I know that my peers and uh, some of my friends, the people I'm around every day, uh, are going to become sexually active with or without abstinence-only education. Uh, the proof is in the hallways of my school. I see it. I see pregnant girls walking down the hall. I know pregnant girls, it's going to happen. You know, we, we are curious and interested and hungry for this information about healthy relationships, abstinence, uh, sexually transmitted infections, and contraception. I have gone out and pursued information on my own time that wasn't provided to me or that was unclear in my health class. Not all of my peers will go out and find information, and when they do, there's the risk that they will find inaccurate information. Uh, whether it be on the internet, from television, um, wouldn't we rather they uh, have information that is accurate and given to them in a formal environment? There's not risk of inf misinformation. We're taking a risk if we were to pass uh, abstinence-only education because students, my friends and myself, want this information and we will look for it and what we find may not be suitable, accurate, factual. I think the current, the current curriculum really meets all students' needs and all parents' needs for that matter because not only can the local school district decide and choose what parts of the curriculum will be included, but parents can review that curriculum and then they have to opt their student into that instruction. So for example, I taught at Timpanogos High School 
in the Alpine School District for six years. And I would send home the state provided permission form to parents two weeks prior to instruction. And the parents could choose from four different options. They could choose to have their son or daughter receive all of the instruction, okay, in, including instruction about how contraception can minimize the risks of uh, STDs and HIV. They could also check a box that says, I would like my student to receive the, all of the prepared instruction minus instruction related to contraception or condoms. They could also check a box that says, before any instruction and before I return this permission form, I'd like to come meet with you and discuss your curriculum and take a look at all of your materials. And then finally, they could check a box that says, I do not want my son or my daughter to receive any sexuality instruction. Interestingly enough, after teaching high school for almost a dozen years, um, I could count the number of students that were opted out of, of anything on one hand. I had probably three or four parents come and talk to me. And by the way, that's what I would do as a parent. Be engaged. If you're not going to be engaged in your child's education, you know, go to the back of the line, be a parent. Um, I would have three or four, I've had three or four that would check that box saying, I would really like to come and look at your curriculum and talk to you first about what your instruction is going to include. And in every instance, those parents after meeting with me would say, hey, you know, I'm actually comfortable with what you're going to teach. And I feel you're going to give a strong, abstinence message, that abstinence is a reality, that if my son or my daughter want to remain absent before marriage, they can. Um, and that's absolutely the message that we deliver in Utah schools. And that's the frustrating thing about this bill, is the, uh, the part where they want districts to opt out of teaching human sexuality at all, so that none of the kids get this, or and the way the bill is right now, none of them would get any information about contraception, only abstinence. Well, that's already in there. If a parent doesn't want their child to have that information, they don't need to sign the permission slip. If the permission slip is not signed, the child will go to the library that day, they will not get that information. So that's already in place, and we feel like we, it, there, there really isn't anything that needs to be fixed with what the current system is right now. I was in attendance when Representative Wright introduced House Bill 363. I was at the House Education Committee meeting uh, and I heard the way that he presented that. He talked about driver education. And ironically enough, I was a high school driver ed teacher. And he said, you know, we don't teach our students how to break the law, how to speed and not get caught. Well, what you're saying is kind of like if you teach students to follow the speed limit and then you teach them that speed limit's 55 in, in driver's ed, we would teach you that. Do we teach you, do we encourage you to go buy a radar detector? Do we encourage you how to, how to identify cops or something like this? No, we don't. We basically teach you that the speed limit's 55, go 55 or you're going to get a ticket. If I could speak with Representative Wright, here's what I would tell him. I would say, we, we teach young people to drive safely. In fact, we teach them defensive driving skills, but we also teach them to wear their safety belt. Because even the best driver may at some point be in a motor vehicle collision. We call that a harm reduction approach. We're going to reduce the amount of harm that this young person experiences in a collision. That is not a mixed message. That's rather a complete message. Please drive safely and also wear a seatbelt. When we talk about uh, harm avoidance approaches, and that's what abstinence is, we're gonna deliver one message, and that is to avoid any harm, any potential for harm. That's inconsistent with what we do elsewhere in public health and in education. 60% of those who took an abstinence pledge, a vow to remain absent until marriage in their middle and high school years, did indeed engage in risky sexual behavior before marriage. If I was going to be able to address the Senate in a committee or the whole Senate, that I would say that, that the Utah parents want their child to have what is in the curriculum right now for health class. They want them to be taught abstinence. They want them to be taught that there, there are contraceptive methods out there, but they all have their drawbacks and failures, and so they 
You know, that to learn about that is not going to teach them or tell them to go out and have sex. It is going to teach them that they probably want to be abstinent because that's the safest thing. A representative Wright told me, he said, you know, I've had to come in two other times, step in and stop Planned Parenthood from getting their curriculum into the schools, and I had to do it this time again. And I said, well, Representative Wright, uh, this, does, this bill isn't going to fix that. What you're talking about in this bill is high school and junior high health class. It's not going to do anything for maturation. So it really won't. Our public schools should not be a venue for private institutions and organizations. Plant Parenthood provides abortions. They have a $300 billion budget a year. Throughout the United States, nine out of every 10 women that walk in Planned Parenthood pregnant come out with an abortion. They should not have access. I was at the hearing when Representative Wright um, brought out that statistic saying that nine out of 10 women who come into pre Planned Parenthood who are pregnant um, leave with an abortion. And what I assume he's pulling that information from is from what Senator Kyle said last year when the federal government was looking at defunding Planned Parenthood at the federal level and during one of the congressional hearings he um, mentioned that 90 percent of what Planned Parenthood does is providing abortion services and then he of course didn't retract that statement necessarily but instead said his statement wasn't meant to be factually based but the fact of the matter is three percent of the, the services we provide nationally um, our abortion services, the bulk of our services um, are preventative health services, trying to prevent unwanted pregnancy, as well as help women maintain their reproductive health so that they can become pregnant when they're ready and wanting to have children. In Utah, we provided over 100,000 services last year to 57,000 clients. And of those services we provided, it was less than 1% in Utah. So our abortion rate is quite low in Utah. Another thing that um, Representative Wright said during the hearing was that Planned Parenthood had a $300 billion budget, annual budget. Of course, we would love to have that big of a budget, but we do not. Nationally, the budget is around $3 billion and much less, of course, than that in the state of Utah. The support for House Bill 363 um, is, is an odd thing, in all honesty. When we talk to Utahns, when I talk to parents, I talk to students, I talk to my neighbors, um, I listen to the radio, listen to Doug Wright, conservative talk radio in Utah, family value talk radio. Um, I, I don't hear people supporting House Bill 363. Rather, I hear people who say, we in Utah believe in local control. Why would the state tell schools in Juab County how to go about sexuality education. I hear people in Utah say, we believe that knowledge empowers people. We believe in agency, and in order for our young people to use that agency in making correct choices and good decisions, they need information. That's what I hear Utah saying. So where does House Bill 363 come from, and where does support for this come from? I think it comes from a very, very verbal minority, both in the state and outside of the state. Well-funded, entrenched in conservative core values. They deliver their message with fear, fear that young people are losing innocence, fear that we're teaching young people that they can have sex and avoid every consequence. I don't think House Bill 363 represents the views of the majority of Utahns, not at all. I'm a mother of four and my husband and I were very close to our kids, especially when they were teenagers and we always talked to them about what we expected and we expected them to be abstinent but we weren't afraid for them to learn a little bit about um, contraception and how to prevent pregnancies and STDs. I knew they didn't think that because we wanted them to know that information, I knew they wouldn't think that we wanted them to go ahead and go have sex and just use protection. We knew that they understood that we expected them to be abstinent but we knew that they also might have friends that they might be able to share this information with and help them. I know that not all parents talk to their kids about sex and about abstinence and how to prevent pregnancies and STDs, and I wish all of them did. In a perfect world, that's what would happen. All the parents would just be close to their kids and talk to them all the time. 
and that just doesn't happen. My wish is not for world peace, but for parents to talk to their kids and get closer to them. At the end of the day, I'm a parent and I'm a teacher. I love my children, I love the school children in Utah. Abstinence, there is no question and no one disagrees, is the most important thing they can do right now to preserve their health and to prepare for a wonderful life and a great marriage. I practiced abstinence before marriage and it blessed my life. I will allow my children to receive abstinence-based education in Utah schools. I want them to hear about the benefits of abstinence from a teacher. That message will support what my children have been taught in their home. I also want my children in a public school setting to receive instruction related to contraception and condoms. And their ability and their weakness in preventing the spread of STDs, including HIV. That's a complete message. My children need to hear that.